We've now got to a point where we've got the basic design right. Uh, we've got a car which weighs about seven tonnes. It's powered by a jet engine and a rocket motor. It's 13.5 metres long. It's got 125,000 horsepower. It's the most powerful car that's ever been built. And the fascinating thing about it is it looks completely different to anything we've ever seen before. One of the goals of this project is to use this car, this hopefully an iconic vehicle, to teach young people about science, to get young people excited about science, and to encourage them to stick with science, technology, mathematics, so that they can be the people of the future who become the engineers who are solving you know, the problems that we have in this world. Man, that was hard work. Coming down to 300, looking for the recovery crew, can't see them. Dust on the outside, recovery crew visual. In 1997, Andy Green set a new world land speed record, reaching the supersonic speed of 763.035 miles per hour. The Thrust SSC project was led by Richard Noble, who himself had set a world land speed record in 1983. Now, led again by Richard and piloted by Andy, with aerodynamics research funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, they want to do it all again. But this time, not only are they aiming to reach a speed of a thousand miles per hour, they also want to inspire a new generation of engineers and scientists. Richard explains the background to the project. This is a quite extraordinary story. Um, it was the idea of Lord Drayson. Lord Drayson was the Minister for Defence Equipment and, uh, and Support for the Ministry of Defence, and he had a real problem. His problem was simply that uh, there was a shortage of engineers, and he realised that back in the last century when Britain did these fantastic aerospace projects, like, for instance, the Vulcan bomber, the TSR-2, the Lightning Fighter, and, uh, and of course, Concorde, he realised that during that period there was simply no shortage of engineers. Why? Well, because basically all the kids at school were very fired up by these tremendous programmes. Then, of course, Britain stopped doing these projects, and so, consequently, um, the, the supply of engineers began to fall off. So um, it's a real problem, because when we look forward to uh, what's going to happen in this country, everything we know, everything we touch, everything we use has got to change. Um, our houses have got to change, our transport's got to change, our aircraft, our railways, our cars. We've got to move into a low-carbon world. And the reality is we haven't got any engineers, so um, how on earth are we going to do it? So we set about doing the ultimate land speed record project. Now, we've held the land speed record twice before with Thrust 2 and Thrust SSC, but these were cars which, uh, where we literally had to sort of um, scrape around to get um, the, uh, the, the old technology, which is all we had access to. So, for instance, the Thrust SSC engines were 1960s technologies. Now, they're 30 years old. With this project, of course, now we're able to use the most advanced technology we possibly can. And so we've got, the, for instance, the Eurofighter engine, the EJ200, which is the most advanced jet engine anywhere. And we've also got a huge rocket motor. It's an incredible program. And I think Lord Drayson's right. I think what's going to happen is it's going to really excite people. And as a result of this, um, we're going to be able to run our programs through uh, every single school in the country and the kids are going to be able to come down here and actually see the car being built and follow it all through. Ben Evans is a research assistant at the School of Engineering at Swansea University. Ben is doing the computational modelling of the aerodynamics research for the project. Obviously a car that's travelling at faster than the speed of sound um, and hopefully 1,000 miles per hour one of the massive things that we need to understand about how this car behaves is, is how does the air flow around it. Um, and essentially the study of aerodynamics is the study of airflow. What does air do to objects that it's flowing around? Now traditionally, this kind of uh, research might have been done in wind tunnels. There are numbers of problems with, with running this, this kind of application in a wind tunnel. One of them is that we're running across the ground and you can't roll a ground in a wind tunnel at a thousand miles per hour. But today, with the advent of modern computing, we can do the same thing that you would traditionally do in a wind tunnel, but on a big supercomputer. What sort of research could come about as a result of this project that could make a difference to our lives in the future in, in other areas? That's, that's a great question. Computational modelling, which is, I mean, the broad, in the broader sense, what we're doing at Swansea University, essentially, we're taking um, the governing equations of any physical problem, 
which in, in many cases is, is a set of partial differential equations. For example, I, I sit in an office at Swansea University and the researcher on the desk next to me is studying hemodynamics, so blood flow through the arterial system. And one of her uh, research projects at the moment is to, to understand uh, valves within the heart uh, and how they, they react to different uh, hemodynamic blood flow uh, scenarios. So the, the spin-offs in terms of you know, the kind of things that we're developing in the world of computational modeling are massive. You know, any system that you can describe essentially by partial differential equations can be solved using the methods of computational modeling. We're talking about something, a car that looks a little bit like an aircraft traveling, the kind of speeds that aircraft travel at. So the kind of technologies we're developing specifically for Bloodhound, you know, trying to capture shock waves accurately, have uh, direct implications for the aerospace industry, obviously. You know, that's the kind of place you would expect to find objects traveling at these sort of speeds. But you know, in, in, in the same you know, research group that I'm working in, you know, we're developing codes to solve electromagnetic problems, so lightning strike of aircraft, things like that. So what will it be like to drive the fastest car in the world? Richard Noble has a pretty good idea from his own experience behind the wheel of Thrust 2 in 1983, when he set a world land speed record of 633.468 miles per hour. You're not there for any kind of excitement, and basically, if you've got a driver who gets all excited, you've got the wrong person. You know, it's a very cold-blooded um, process. One fifty looking for Minburn. Nice light together, slightly wriggly. Two hundred looking for Max. You're getting off the line with full power, so you've got thirty-five thousand horsepower between naught and three hundred miles an hour. The car's all over the place, so you've got to work really hard to keep the front wheels in front of the back wheels and keep it all going. You're driving down a lane which is only 50 foot wide and then um, uh, you get to the sort of um, what we call the threshold speed which is about 300 miles an hour and it seems to sort of stabilise and then uh, 300 to 550 is boring because it's more of the same really but once you get about 550 it gets very interesting because the airflow starts to go supersonic over bits of it and you start seeing the shockwaves build up and um, the extraordinary thing too I found was that your mental process, I've been doing this for a long time, so your mental process is speed right up and everything happens in very, very slow motion. So you can see every single detail on the ground come up and go underneath the car at 650 miles an hour. And then you go through the measured mile and then you've got to think about stopping and this is where the fun starts. And you, you've, got to go th you've got to allow the engine three seconds to cool at 98% and that seems like an eternity. And then only then can you fire the brake parachute. And when the brake parachute comes out, um, you get between 5 and 6 G decelerations, you know, losing speed at about 130-odd miles an hour per second. And the human body isn't really capable of taking this, so you get an extraordinary effect called a somatographic illusion. And it upsets the inner ear, and you think you're driving vertically downwards into the centre of the Earth. You're starting to bring it back. Bring it back. Over 600. Five thirty. Shoot one. Good shoot. Both oils, no worries. And then you're down to literally four hundred miles an hour or so, and then you've got to bring the wheel brakes in at two hundred. That's the process. So Andy Green is uh, again the man at this time. What sort of character is he? Andy's very, very cool. He's um, an absolute first-class mathematician. He's got two thousand hours of fast jet experience. He's extremely good at this. He's always the best in the world. It's really as simple as that. And uh, this whole car has been designed around him. Man, that was hard work. Coming down to 300, looking for the recovery crew. Can't see them. Dust on the outside, recovery crew visual. 